Good morning, everybody. How are we doing this morning? Hello. <laughs> All right, so um, before we begin this morning, I thought we could bring back a fun tradition that we haven't done in a while, but I think it's very important. Um, if you guys could stand and greet one another this morning, maybe find someone that you have not met yet, or maybe you don't talk to very often. Let me just say a quick hello, and then we'll begin in worship.
My weapon is a melody. I raise a hallelujah. And heaven comes to fight for me. this morning. He is so good. His presence is so 
sweet and fun and free.
morning, church. Go ahead and be seated. All right, this is that time that we set aside as a church family to take communion together. And if you're visiting with us today, in a, in a few moments, they're going to pass around the trays. And there's a stack of cups in there. And the bread is in the bottom one. The juice is in the top. So make sure that you grab one of those. And now as we take our minds and, and focus them to the cross, um, lots of the times I, when I'm going in my head space as we start to do communion, you know, we, lots of times we look at Luke 22 and it talks about the Passover when Jesus pulled his disciples together and, and he instituted the Lord's Supper. But as I was getting ready today, I was thinking, you know, some of those old communion songs that we used to sing. And this one comes right out of Luke 22. So I'm going to read the words to you because it really gets your mind where it should be. When we meet in sweet communion, where the feast divine is spread, hearts are brought in closer union while partaking of the bread. God so loved what wondrous measure, loved and gave the best of head, brought us with that matchless treasure, yea, for us his life was given. Feast divine, all else surpassing, precious blood for you and me. While we sup, Christ gently whispers, do this in my memory. Precious feast, all else surpassing, wondrous love for you and me. While we feast, Christ gently whispers, do this in my memory. Again, Luke 22, 19. And he took the bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in my memory. During this time, we also take a moment to give back to the work of the church. We make several ways available. You can give through the church app. You can also do, um, like my husband and I do, we do it through bill pay at our church. Or you can do it the good old-fashioned way and write a check or cash as they pass around the bags. When we look at 2 Corinthians, I like to look at 2 Corinthians 9, where it says, Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give not reluctantly, under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Shall we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this time that we've set aside to remember your son's sacrifice on the cross. And also, Father, thank you for all the blessings that you have given us in this life that we give back to you for your work. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Happy Super Bowl Sunday. If your team's playing, congratulations. I'm more excited about the halftime show, but that tells you a little bit about what I listened to in high school. <laughs> I just uh, wanted to give you guys some announcements for service this Sunday. We are doing an Angels game. I'm super excited about it. If you like the Angels, if you don't like the Angels, you should still come out. It's going to be an awesome time. It's going to be on May 21st um, at 6.08 is the first pitch, and they're $22 a ticket. So if you guys want to, you can go guest relations and sign up there. We're also women's ministry. We're having an event, candle making event. Should be really cool. Uh, it's going to be $25. You can sign up at Guest Relations. It will be in March, on March 12th. Um, I only have 20 spots available. We're going to be going to their studio, so they only have room for 20 people. So if that's something you're interested in, I would sign up as soon as possible. Base camp, if you are having a base camp, the kids, I know they're not in here, but they're having a backwards party on February 16th. It's not gonna cost anything, it's just a fun event. So if your kids don't normally go to base camp on Wednesday nights, this might be one that they can go to just to kind of get used to it. It's gonna be super fun. Um, north of 50, your potluck is today, and then you guys still have your signups for the eating out event. Um, guest, if you're new here, or if you've been here a couple Sundays and I haven't met you yet, I would love to meet you. I'm going to be over here at Guest Relations. I'll have a little gift for you, and um, we will be, I'll, I'll love to meet you. Um, we also have Prayer Central. If you need prayer, you can uh, sign up on that connection card in the seat back in front of you. You can put your prayer request there, drop it in one of the boxes, give it to Guest Relations, or just stop over there at Prayer Central after service. We have people over there that would love to pray, pray with you. Um, I don't think I have any more announcements. If I forgot any, I'm sorry. Just stop by Guest Relations. They'll be able to tell you anything else that we have 
Um, but for now, I'm going to invite Robbie up um, to help finish service. The joy of the Lord is our strength. That's a verse out of Nehemiah 8:10, and it's a fascinating verse. When you first read it, for the joy of the Lord is your strength, you kind of hold on to it as this kind of fun little, that would be great to a needlepoint or crochet or put on a plaque and sell at the Christian bookstore kind of thing and have that on the wall. The joy of the Lord is your strength. But when you look a little deeper at that verse and you follow the rules of interpretation of good handling of scripture that I always teach my students, I've told you this, I like being repetitive about some things so that you remember it. Uh, eventually you say, all right, all right, we know what you're going to say. The three rules of studying scripture are the same as the three rules of real estate. What are the, what are the top three rules of real estate? Location, location, location. And the top three rules of studying scripture are location, location, location. You look at the context of the verse, and then you look a little wider. You say, what's going on? So when you look at this verse and you say, oh, that's neat. That, that's kind of an encouraging verse. The joy of the Lord is your strength. And then you start looking a little wider. In this case, it throws a wrench in the works. Because right before this verse in Nehemiah chapter 8, we're told that the people are sobbing uncontrollably. And this verse is the response of the leadership. And that made me go, huh, <laughs> what's up with that? That doesn't make any sense. And so I continued to study a little wider, more and more the context. Why are they sobbing? It's this beautiful moment. In many ways, they've built a new platform. They've come together as a people after a long time not being able to come together. They've got all the prominent leaders on the stage of this new platform. And they're having this big ceremony where the word of the Lord is being read from sun up until noon. They read the scriptures, Ezra does does and all of the people you know i picture this like a movie you know this epic scene if the if the 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 drone camera comes flying in and you see oh there's some kids playing with some scraps of wood oh here's a bigger crowd the wood must be from this brand new stage that was just built oh the leaders are on the stage oh there's a big crowd there's 46,000 we're told in the scriptures gathered for this reading of the word of the lord and you think this is a great celebration and then the audio picks up a little bit and you get a little closer in your look at the crowd and you realize they're not celebrating shoulders are moving up and down up and down they're sobbing and grieving uncontrollably. It's such an odd little thing when you look a little wider at this verse and the leaders say, the joy of the Lord will be your strength. And that makes you say, what is going on in this passage? And the way to understand it, I think, is to do a couple of things. One, to do a flashback and ask ourselves, what led to this moment that caused the people to be grieving and sobbing the way they were? And then after we do that, I think we have to do a flash forward to say, what else do the leaders do or say that makes sense of them saying the joy of the Lord is your strength in this uniquely challenging moment? We have to do, to use Marvel's language, we need an origin story that tells us why they're crying. Uh, or, or if you're really old, we'll do the, the Paul Harvey thing, right? That verse is odd, and now you need to know the rest of the story. When we look a little wider and we go back historically, we go all the way back to the beginning of Israel in the book of Exodus. And Israel is a people who are uh, enslaved by Egypt. Egypt makes its economy built on the back of human trafficking of a slave trade, and it's all the Hebrew people. And God inserts himself into that moment in history and says to Pharaoh, enough of this human trafficking, enough of this slave trade. My people are free, and he works them free. And the people come out into the wilderness in the book of Exodus, uh, and they're alone with God. He gives them the law, which becomes their constitution, teaches them how to build a tabernacle so that they can be together in the wilderness and be this new people called out by God. You will be my people. I will be your God. You be faithful to me. I'll be faithful to you. I will protect you and bless you. And so there's this beautiful birth 
of the moment of Israel as a nation. Passover is a celebration of that birth. So that uh, on Passover, on the eve of Passover, uh, the question that children always ask that when the family gathers together to celebrate is, why is this evening like no other? And then the family tells the story of the oppressed people who were rescued by God brought out of the wilderness and turned into a nation. And then the book of Leviticus is just this 30-day period on the top of Mount Sinai, God's little schoolhouse in Mount Sinai, where he teaches them, here's how an unholy people can be with a holy God. He gives them uh, five offerings and seven feasts uh, in order to show God gratitude and celebrate his goodness. Here are the rules. Here's how you've worshiped me in the temple, in the tabernacle. Here's how an unholy people spend time with a holy God. And then Numbers, the next book in our storyline in scripture is the testing of the people after they've been rescued and taught. Anybody know whether they pass or fail that test? Are you familiar with the book of Numbers? They fail it miserably. The book of Numbers is one of the most depressing books in all of scripture. If you're in a good mood and you'd like that to go away, just start reading the book of Numbers (laughs) because it is account after account of God's people rejecting him and refusing to obey him and suffering the consequences so that they wander in the wilderness for 40 years and that entire first generation that refused to trust God and go into the promised land. Remember the story of the 12 spies? They did a census. There was one to two million people ready to go in and take the promised land that God was leading them to. But uh, 12 went in and they came out and, and 10 said, those people are so big, we're like grasshoppers. And two came out and said, our God is so big, that country's full of grasshoppers, you know. But they went with the American way, the majority rules. And they went with the 10 and refused to trust God and go in. And so they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. That entire generation passed away. And then a new generation rose up and they're right outside the promised land to go in. Any school teachers here? So if every kid in your class fails, what do you do? If they fail a test, what do you do? You encourage them, that's right. You also reteach the material, right? If I give a test and there's 100% fail rate, 100%, then I'm like, okay, I need to reteach this material. And that's exactly what the book of Deuteronomy is. Have you ever been reading the scriptures and discovered, uh, start reading in Deuteronomy, like, haven't I read this before? Have you ever had that? kind of sensation it's because the book of deuteronomy is moses standing up and delivering three long sermons where he basically retells everything that's happened in the life of israel to this new generation that didn't live through it so that they know the history before they go into the promised land and the book of joshua is them getting tested again do they pass or fail in joshua anybody know They pass at the beginning of Joshua. They conquer and take the promised land. But by the end of the book of Joshua, they're already drifting away from God. So that Joshua has to say those familiar verses to the people. I don't know about you, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And he says that because there are many going away from the Lord, embracing the culture and the pagan culture around them. So that we're bumped into the book of Judges where this cycle repeats itself again and again, where Israel is in good shape and they're like, yay, we love you, God. And then they forget about him. And then they get tied up in sin and oppression from another nation. And they beg God for rescue, just like they were begging as slaves in Egypt. And so God raises up a judge, a leader, 13 times in the book of Judges, a judge is raised up and come and freeze Israel from their oppression. And they say, yay, thank you, God. And then they drift back into forgetting about God, thinking only of themselves and get tied up in sin again. And so Gideon or Deborah or Samson rescues the people, but the pattern is the same. So that by the end of the book of Judges, the last verse in the book of Judges summarizes this time period and summarizes the book of Judges. It says, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. That's how Israel was living. And it's important key to remember, sometimes when you're looking at hard uh, portions in the Old Testament, it's not a prescription of what God wanted. It's a description of what Israel was doing in disobedience. Some people go to the Old Testament and find really hard passages in Judges and say, look at the God of the Old Testament. But when you, when you do the location, 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 context, 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 when you back that camera lens up and say, wait, what's going on? You realize that's not a prescription of what God intended. It's a description of Israel being disobedient. So that by the end of the book of Judges, the author says this season is described as a time when everyone did what was right in their own eyes. 
They demand a king from God at this point in their history. And God says, you don't need a king. I'm your king. And they say, we want a king. We want to be just like everybody else. Everybody's wearing the cool jeans. We want the cool jeans. We don't care. You know, we want a king. Look, if you're not going to like it. He's going to take your daughters. He's going to tax you. We want a king. And so God lets them have a king. And King Saul is a horrible king with no heart toward God. King David comes, and even though he's full of sin and struggle and failure, he's still described as a person after God's own heart. He's a good king. See, being good, being a person after God's own heart doesn't mean that you're without sin. Can I get an amen? Amen. We could just stop here and sing amen the rest of the service, couldn't we? Amen. Amen. Because we're all sinners, and we need God's grace. And I'm so glad that to be a person after God's own heart does not mean I'm without sin. What it means is I'm broken over my sin. I bring my sin to God. I turn to him. I repent. I confess it. I accept his forgiveness. And that's what David does. But that's a short-lived time of a faithful king so that Solomon comes next and he's a half-hearted king who has so many irons in the fire to build his kingdom and to build his land that he makes treaties and pacts with and lots of concubines and princes from other lands and he builds temples to all their gods so that by the end of his uh, reign uh, there's idolatry throughout the land and his son Rehoboam takes the reins and says you think you think my dad was heavy handed he says my pinky is going to be as thick as my dad's waist meaning you think he was heavy handed I'll show you heavy handed and he taxes the people so aggressively that the nation of Israel splits into two nations between the north and the south judah is the name the southern nation takes and israel is the name the northern nation takes and this brings us into the time of the prophets for 400 years god sends prophet after prophet to israel saying repent please turn back i'm your god you're my people i love you i I don't want hardship to come your way But he can't ignore the idolatry and the child sacrifice and the pagan activity that is flourishing in Israel. So he's patient for 400 years. This is the season of time when he has Hosea the prophet take a prostitute as wife who continues to be a prostitute after she's his wife. And he says, this is so Israel will see what's happening to my heart. I love Israel, and she continues to be unfaithful to me, to betray me. He tries to explain the judgment that's coming for Israel, the harshness. He says to Israel, listen, I'm like a mother lion who might roar at her cubs to get, her, get the cubs away from danger out of an act of love. Do you understand that? Could you see a mama, a mama lion roaring in such a way that it scared the bejeebies out of the cubs, but they ran back to her? And in that moment, they might have thought, she's mean, but she knows I'm calling them away from danger. And God says to Israel, I'm begging, I'm pleading through the prophet's repent. And Israel says, no, we're not. We want our way. We're going to do it our way. We know what's best. It's my life. I'm going to live it how I, no one gets to tell me what to do, right? Sounds a little too familiar, doesn't it? Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. That's the American way, baby. We can't even comprehend what it means that our lives are not our own. Right? That just sounds bizarre to think that our lives are not our own. We live this out in church. You know, I didn't like that sermon. I didn't like that preacher. Somebody got my parking space. Somebody used our Sunday school when they didn't have permission. We're going to get a group together. Because what? We're all individuals. We're all able, we need our feelings, our toes should not be stepped on, we should get our way, people should listen to us. We, we can't even comprehend sometimes what it means to be servants, to be the people of God, to be subservient to him, to give up our very rights, our very feelings, our very hearts for the sake of God and his kingdom. And Israel, just like us, we're just like them, and they refuse until God can no longer protect them. Israel is conquered by Assyria and scattered to the four corners of the earth because Assyrians' foreign policy when they conquered a nation was to scatter them to all the other nations they'd conquered so they'd have no sense of identity left to possibly rise up and retaliate. That's the lost tribes of Israel forever gone in history like dust in the wind. Judah lasts a little bit longer. During that 400-year period, uh, there's 39 kings in, in Judah, 40 in Israel. The 40 kings in Israel were told in scripture that zero of those 40 kings were good. Zero. 
so they fall first. Eight kings in Judah are called good, so they last a little bit longer, but they fall. And they fall to Babylon, who takes them into exile, because that was Babylon's foreign policy. You conquer a nation, you bring them back to, the, to your land, and you get the best and the brightest of that group you've conquered and get them involved and kind of assimilate them to your culture. So we have those stories of Daniel and others being called to serve the king, but refusing to worship anyone but their one true God. But after those 70 years, Persia conquers Babylon, Babylonia, um, and uh, they, come, they tell Israel that Israel can go back to the promised land. So Nehemiah leads a group back to the promised land to rebuild the walls and miraculously rebuilds the walls. And there was so much opposition from those who were in the land that they had to hold a sword in one hand and a shovel in the other while they were working. We're even told that when they went, got a drink of water, they kept their sword out while they were pausing to get a drink of water. And they rebuild the wall and they gather to celebrate this great day of being back in their land about 70 years of, after 70 years of exile, not being able to hear the word of the Lord read, not being able to have their priests serve them, not being able to be on their land. And they build this platform and they gather and they tap Ezra, you're the man. And Ezra gets up and reads from daylight until noon the word of the Lord and everyone sobs uncontrollably because they know what I just told you they look around and they say there's 46,000 here and there was one to two million of us all those deaths all those lost and they're on us God begged and pleaded for hundreds of years through the prophets and we refuse to listen look at what has become of our nation and so they're sobbing and they're grieving, honestly, justifiably. I mean, when I first looked at that, I'm like, they should be grieving. The, the heaviness, we, we see it. We see, we see the heaviness of sin in our culture, don't we? Our prisons are packed. We all probably have friends or family who've been impacted by addiction that just destroys lives. We see the price of sin in our culture. It merits grief. And so part of me thinks, yeah, when I first studied that, I'm like, yeah, they should be grieving. Which makes it all the weirder that the leaders pop up and go, the joy of the Lord will be your strength. <laughs> like, is that like saying buck up little camper at a funeral? I mean, you know, are they that out of touch? What are they thinking? And so I think you have to do this flash forward to try to figure out what they're thinking. And, and, and here's what the leaders do. They, they not only say, stop grieving, the joy of the Lord will be your strength. They instruct everybody in the rest of chapter 8 in Nehemiah and in chapter 9, they say, we want you to go and we're going to celebrate the Feast of Booths, one of those feasts that God gave Israel in the book of Leviticus, the Feast of Booths. And it was a party. It wasn't like like a, oh, we're Israel, we've got ceremonies, we're back in our land, we better get our ceremonial activities going again. No, 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 it was a seven-day block party. You were told to get all your best food, wheel out the grill on the front lawn, and start frying the food. And you were told to get all the best that you had and share it with anybody who didn't have it so that it was just this big block party. Everybody was eating and drinking and celebrating the Feast of Booths. And then they do what I just did. They do this flashback on the history of Israel. That's where I got the idea, right out of Nehemiah. I'm not near as smart as somebody might think I am. You just get it right there out of the book. That's exactly what they do. They do this flashback in the form of a prayer. 37 verses in Nehemiah chapter 9, and Ezra prays by flashing back over Israel's history, doing just what I did, except here's the different difference. His flashback is God-centered. So that he says just what I said. Oh, Lord, he prays. In every verse of those 37 verses, the word you or yours appears referencing God. It is a God-centered flashback, a God-centered prayer. So he says, Lord, you were faithful when we were faithless. When we complained and whined and didn't listen, you still sent prophets to us. When we were disobedient in this way, you still called us to you. When we, and he goes through the whole history of Israel, illustrating God's faithfulness in light of their faithlessness. So that at the end of that prayer, they celebrate by renewing their covenant with God. What they're saying in this passage when they say the joy of the Lord will be your strength, they're saying the joy of who God is 
His character in light of our failure, his character in light of our sin, his grace in light of our stubbornness, his forgiveness in light of our need of forgiveness, the joy of who God is, the joy of his character will be our strength to go on. Amen? It is not the depth of our sin that is the measure of our standing with God. It is the depth of his grace. Verse 12 in Nehemiah 8 says, they understood, so they celebrated. That might be my favorite verse in all of this. Because after the leaders say, no, 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 stop grieving. Three times they say, don't grieve, don't grieve, don't grieve. Holiness is marked more by celebration of God's goodness than it is by grieving over our own sin. Because if we're not careful, our grieving over our own sin can become a subtle form of self-focus. Do you see that? So that when he stands up, he does this prayer that focuses on God. So the leaders say three times, don't grieve, don't grieve, don't grieve. We're going to celebrate God's faithfulness. And they celebrate with the Feast of Booths. They utter the prayer and they renew their covenant. And like I said, I love that verse. It says they understood, so they celebrated. Hebrews 4.16 says, when we know God's character revealed in Christ, we know we can approach the throne of God. God's throne, no, we can approach his throne boldly, knowing we will receive the grace and the help that we need. Just like a grandchild that runs to grandpa or grandma, knowing I'm probably going to get some candy. There's a mint or a piece of gum or something in a pocket here somewhere, right? I'm going to get a hug. I'm going to get something. We should have this confidence when we approach Christ's throne, knowing we're going to get the grace or the help we need. We understand, and so we celebrate Makes me think of a song from the 70s. Can anybody think of a song from the 70s that might make you think of this moment where they renew their covenant, they're reunited with God? There's the big hint. Can you think of that song? Anybody know? Somebody said it, yeah. Reunited. So let's stand up here for a moment. You ready? I'm serious. Stand up. Let's sing a little bit. So I love that verse in, in 812 that says, after this grieving moment, when the leaders explain to them, And it says they understood, so they celebrated. So everybody now, you ready? Reunited and it feels so good. Reunited because we understood. All right, you can have a seat. (laughs) That's the beauty of that verse, the joy of who God is in light of my sin, in light of my failure, in light of my need. That will be my strength to go on. It makes me think of Luke chapter 15, where the prodigal son leaves the father, and it says in some translations he came to his senses. He's, he's rejected God the father, his father in that parable, and it's an image of God, Jesus says, and he's feeding the, eating the slop that he's feeding the pigs, and he's like, you know what? I could go back to my dad. He comes to his senses. I could go back to my dad and at least just be a servant who lived on the property, and I wouldn't be eating this slop. And he turns and starts that journey back, right? And what are we told? That Jesus says, this is an image of God the Father. We're told that the Father sees him from afar on the porch. He springs from the porch, hikes up his robe, which would be a great embarrassment for a man in that culture to pull up his robe and run like that. He runs, he pounces on him like Tigger on poo, starts kissing his neck. (laughs) This is the revelation of God, the joy of who God is in light of our sin, in light of our failure. That is will be our strength to go on. I know that any given Sunday, there are some of us here who have thought about not going on, who have thought, I've sinned too much. My sins are too great. Everybody else in the room is good, but I'm not. No one knows what I've done. My sins are bad. I, I, I've rejected God. I've betrayed God. I've been unfaithful to my spouse. I've, I've done these things. I've viewed these things. Your standing with God is not measured by the depth of your sin, but by the depth of his grace. And he invites you to turn to him. That's what Christianity is. It's a celebration of God's grace. It is by no stretch of the imagination a celebration of you and I. (laughs) That we're the cream of the crop. That somehow we made ourselves holy through pulling ourselves up by our own bootstraps and God got a good deal out of us. I'm sorry. It's just not true. Even when we're wearing our Sunday best and we're feeling pretty good, we still gather to celebrate God, his goodness, 
his grace, to see things from his perspective, to let his truth be reality for us because it is reality, period. And that's the challenge, to understand and to celebrate. Uh, there, there's, uh, we can put on the screen here, and I, I haven't paid any attention because I never looked at my notes. <laughs> um, what do you see on that screen? Very good, very good. That's exactly what we see. And one author shared this once, and I still remembered it all these years later, that so often that's the way we think about our standing with God. We see the black dot of our failures, of our sins, of our weakness, of our struggles. That's what we see. It's just right here when we think about it, when we look at that, that's what we see. And we miss the widespread mercy of God all around. Which is larger on that screen, the white or the dot? Yeah, the white. And God's mercy, his grace, the depth of his grace is what marks our relationship with him. So that we're invited, like Israel, to understand. Reunited because we understood. Right? And it feels so good. We're, we're invited to understand and to celebrate. We're invited to have a joy in our step that makes people get close to us and smell our breath. That's exactly what happened in Acts chapter 2. There's nothing sacrilegious about that. In Acts chapter 2, the people were so excited about the arrival of the Holy Spirit and Christ being preached that the onlooker said, are these people drunk? And Peter said, nope, because it's only 9 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> I love that that was his answer. <laughs> that he didn't say, no, we don't drink. Instead, he said, no, it's just 9. That's, that's not a good guess. <laughs> Instead... It's the presence of the Spirit. It's the realization of the gospel of Christ being preached. And we ought to have this joy, this freedom that says, because of God's grace, I've, I can lower my shoulders. Because of God's grace, I can walk freely. Because of God's grace, I've got this joy that is my strength. Continue and celebrate this morning. Living looks like, amen? Let's sing it out. 
This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise you. This is what for this morning. We thank you for the joy of the Lord. I ask that you just be with us this week and the, and the rest of today, Father God, just remind us of that joy that you have for us, Lord God, and that we have it at any moment, at any time, Lord God, that we can just call on that, Lord. We just thank you. We praise you. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. You guys have a great week.